good evening, and thank you all so much for having me and my beautiful wife, Gail, here, who is the co-author of this book with me as well. Uh, we are honored to be here in your presence. I can't tell you how much I enjoy being in any place where so many people are all together with the same interest in preserving their local history. Uh, for me, history is my passion in life, and the fact that there's still folks out there that realize there's great value in it and preserving it and documenting it. Um, it brings me great joy to know that. So thank you for what you do here for the Upper Mojave Historical Society because it's great. We have some wonderful deep history here. I heard a little bit about the building and all the efforts put together, not only to obtain it, but to restore it and now to use it so much. Again, I am truly honored to be here in your presence. And thank you very much for having us here tonight. <coughs> So again, my name is David Woodruff. I have the good fortune to live in the next county to the north of me here, up in the wonderful county seat called Independence, the oldest town there on Highway 395 in Indio County. Um, as I said a moment ago, history is my passion in life, though it's only been in my retirement years that I've really become involved in it. It's something that I've always been interested in. And let me tell you, there's not much more that I like to do than talk about history if somebody is willing to sit there and listen to me. So thank you in advance for inviting me upon my passion. So um, this, we did write the book, Tales Along El Camino Sierra. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of El Camino Sierra and how it relates to our part of Eastern California here. And then talk about a little bit about the book and some of the stories in there as well, because the book is not just about the history of El Camino Sierra. In fact, it's mostly a collection of what Gail and I thought were interesting short stories that have happened on history along the Highway 395 corridor. So with that, let me see if I can find my pointer here. I can't. Okay. So if we were here in Eastern California, especially along the base of the Sierra Nevada Mountains back around 1880 or 1890, we would have been probably traveling something like this. I wouldn't have had maybe, if I would have came down to visit you tonight, I probably would have had to have left about five days ago to make it in time. Travel was still by wagon and horse and buggy and mules and oxen and the like. Just crude roads is all that pretty much existed in the area, and that's how people were traveling along. But all that was about to change. Now, even in Bishop in 1890, which is, of course, the biggest town in the eastern Sierras, it was still had dirt roads and still horses were the mode of transportation as recently as 1890. But around the turn of the century, people started developing the automobile or the horseless carriage, if you will. Henry Ford, one of his first things was a quadricycle that he came out with in 1896. He took that idea and kept on going with it. I find this one of the most interesting statistics I think I've ever come across. Once the Model T came out in 1908, over the next 19 years, he made 16 million of these vehicles. If nothing else, what this shows is that the American public, once we had the ability to obtain a reasonably priced uh, vehicle that they could transport us pretty darn quickly, we were going to gobble that up in a hurry. And the automobile, the age of the automobile, certainly came upon the scene very quickly, shortly after the turn of the century. But if we were going to have all these newfangled automobiles to make a trip in, we were going to need some kind of roadway to travel upon. The roads were mostly built for horses. The horses could deal OK with the mud and the ruts and what have you, but the automobiles, not so much. The first couple of years of automobile traffic, I think the horses probably still played a pretty important part in making sure the automobiles were able to get around. So the public started looking to their government to get some money to build better roads in their areas. Certainly local governments, cities and counties, didn't have the kind of money it was going to take to build new modern highways for the new horseless carriages to make their travel upon. So the state was going to be the one that seemed like it was going to take up the biggest burden of that. The state legislature, listening to all their constituents, said, we want better roads in our areas, in the urban areas, in the rural areas. Well, that was going to cost a chunk of change. And the legislature wasn't going to appropriate money out of the budget on their own. They told the voters, if you want better roads, you're going to have to pay for them in the form of a bond measure. So in April, 
1910, the California State Legislature scheduled a bond vote for that following November of 1910. They were going to have $18 million be available if the voters would approve it to build better roads throughout the state of California. Well, here in Inyo County, to the north of us here, something called the Inyo Good Road Club form. The Good Road Movement had a national uh, blend to it. In fact, it actually got its start with bicycle travel in the 1880s, looking for better roads for the people to ride with uh, bicycles on back east. But it kind of spread as the automobile took hold, the Good Road Club became just that. They were looking for better roads in their local areas, and there were literally hundreds of chapters throughout the United States. In 1910, Indio County only had about 5,000 people living there at that time, yet they had 64 charter members that all gathered together that spring of 1910 for the efforts of lobbying the state to get a share of their highway budget spent in Indio and Mono counties, uh, if, if the bond measure were to pass that year. So in April of 1910, the Inyo Good Road Club formed. The 64 charter members were off, all the way from Low Pine, as far north as the Bridgeport area as well. This gentleman here, W. Gillette Scott, he was actually the corresponding secretary of the Inyo Good Road Club, but he was the primary mover and the shaker of coming up with the name El Camino Sierra. The thought was, how are we going to get some of that money in our rural County of Inyo if that bond measure passes in November. Well, it's going to take a little bit of marketing and promotion, getting the attention of the state legislatures that, hey, we're over here. We deserve some of that money as well. Well, Scott, a couple of years before, had traveled the wagon roads, if you will, that had run between the Bay Area and Southern California. Those coastal communities, realizing that as the automobile grew in use, that tourism was probably going to be an important part of the industry on these roads that were going to pass from these various areas. Those folks over on the coast already had come up in 1904 with a name called the El Camino Real for their coastal highway. They were marketing it like crazy, and W. Gillette Scott saw what they were doing. He took that idea back and told his folks at the end of the road clubs, well, those folks over there in Paso Robles and Salinas, Ventura, and Santa Barbara, they seem pretty good at promoting their El Camino Real. Why don't we come up with the name El Camino Sierra? It's catchy, takes uh, into account our Spanish heritage as well. We'll use that as our marketing term. We'll name our wagon road that goes along the base of the Eastern Sierras El Camino Sierra. That'll be sure to gain the attention of the state legislature and hopefully a little bit of that highway bond measure money if it passes that following November. So the name El Camino Sierra was born. The idea was for a highway to run from Mojave, which in those days was kind of the end of civilization as far as good roads go, all the way north to Lake Tahoe. And they were going to call it that entire distance, again, that romantic sounding name of El Camino Real. This is a, I'm sure any of you that have traveled on Highway 101, these are still being used today. Caltrans maintains them, but the El Camino Real folks actually placed about 800 of these mission bells hanging on the shepherd's staff as their official symbol of the El Camino Real. So they thought, okay, we're going to name it El Camino Sierra, we'll get some publicity with that. We better take a section of our wagon road we'll call it the first section of El Camino Sierra. We'll have a dedication, a big party, get the newspapers to come and write stories about it. Let's invite the governor of California. Maybe he'll come to Inyo County and he'll preside over our dedication of the first stretch of El Camino Sierra. A great publicity move if they could pull it off. They sent a letter to Sacramento. Governor James Gillette at the time said, where's Inyo County? <laughs> well, somebody told him, told him it had pretty nice scenery, maybe some good trout fishing over there as well. So Mr. Gillette decided, okay, I'll come to your dedication in August of 1910 for that presiding over the first part of your new El Camino Sierra. He had to take the train as far as Mojave, and some of the folks from Indio County went down in their vehicles and picked him up and brought him north from there. They actually stopped in Indio Kern made their way farther north to Lone Pine and eventually
eventually on up towards the bishop area where the dedication ceremony was held just a little bit south of bishop. This gentleman was the former mayor of Los Angeles, Freddie. Most of us, when we think about the LA Aqueduct, if you're familiar with the fact that we kind of live in a fight to Mendino County, providing lots of water for the city of Los Angeles, most of us think of William Mulholland, and certainly he was the, a big mover and a shaker behind the aqueduct. He designed it, he engineered it, and he managed it up until his retirement in 1928. But it was this man, Freddie, whose actual idea it was. He brought Mulholland up here in, in 1902 to show him just how much water was flowing out of the eastern Sierras. And if they could figure out a way to get it to Los Angeles, the city was going to be able to grow forever. Eaton was mayor from 1898 to 1900, then he kind of retired. He was a fairly wealthy family. And you know what? He retired to Inyo County. He liked it up here. He fished here as a kid with his family back in the 1880s. Fred moved to the Big Pine area, just a little bit north of Big Pine, California, a little bit south there of Bishop. He had thousands of acres of land, and he actually developed back in 1910, a little bit before then, what was one of the largest poultry ranches in the world, the former mayor of Los Angeles, here in Indio <laughs> County, raising chickens like nobody's business. So Fred had all this land, a huge chicken ranch, and of course the wagon road that existed between Lone Pine and Bishop, it ran right alongside the edge of this property. Fred was a most booster and a promoter of tourism here in Indio County by now, even though he was instrumental in taking the water away. He had lots of people that worked at the ranch, and he was actually one of the charter members of the Inyo Good Road Club. Fred sent his workers out to improve the wagon road that ran the one and a quarter mile alongside of his poultry ranch. They moved rocks out of the way. They dragged lumbers along the road trying to flatten it out. They improved the section of road so that could be the very first improved section of the new El Camino Sierra, and that was where the governor was going to come to have the dedication there in August. So right alongside Fred Eaton's chicken ranch was the site chosen there, just a little bit north of uh, Big Pine to have the original dedication. I don't know if this was Fred's road or not. Yeah. I guess that it was, that was probably what they considered the improved road at the time, but <laughs> it had, this picture is from Indio County somewhere. I just like it, I thought throw it in there. So on August 31st, 1910, after Governor Gillette made his way from Mojave north through Indio mm -hmm. Kern, Lone Pine, and on and up towards Big Pine, they had this big celebration there just outside of Big Pine along Fred's Chicken Ranch. The governor was there, hundreds of people from all over Indio County made it, and they dedicated the first section of El Camino Sierra. And yep, indeed, it gained lots and lots and lots of publicity. The papers wrote about it everywhere. Here is the sign that they placed out there, right alongside Fred's ranch. They moved on into Bishop later that night, and that's where they had the final banquet celebration that evening. I, I love this picture because of the hotel. I guess the laser doesn't work too good. But anyway, it's the Estalia Hotel. If any of you are a little bit familiar with Bishop, as you come in from the south on the right-hand side, um, there's the old Vaughn's grocery store. It hasn't been there in, oh, probably almost 20 years now. There's now the Mountain Rambler Brewery, and there's a, a physical therapy. But that's where the Estalia Hotel stood until it burned down in the 1920s. But it was certainly the place to be, and it was where they had the celebratory dinner that night for the new El Camino Sierra. So November came of 1910, and yeah, by gosh, the voters of California, they put their wallets where their desire was, and they approved that $18 million for road building, which was supposed to be spent throughout the state. Well, now the work of the Inyo Good Road Club really needed to get going because the money was indeed going to be there. So Scott, along with others, started to come up with every single promotional effort they could to get the attention of the highway department and the state lawmakers to bring a little bit of that state highway money over here to the eastern Sierras. Right after the bond measure was passed in November, the next year, 1911, it was announced that once the Panama Canal was completed, which was forecasted for 1915, they were going to have a World's Fair in San Francisco. It would be called the Panama Pacific International Expo.
exposition. It was going to be a huge event. No sooner was it announced, but various chambers of commerce throughout the state of California started to say, wow, people are writing us from not only all over the United States, but all over the world telling us they're going to come to the Pan Pacific Exhibition, and they want to know what they should see and what roads they should drive on once they get here. But once Scott and the folks from the Inyo Good Road Club heard that people were interested in driving to California, they came up with an idea to take advantage of the exposition as far as an effort to get attention here to the Eastern Sierras. Scott came up with this. He called it the Pay Sierra, means to wander about. It was going to be a great loop trip that he would urge people to take when they came to the Pan Pacific Exhibition. He knew they were likely to travel to San Francisco because that's where the exhibition was at. And they'd probably make their way down here. I'm just going to stand in front of this for a minute. San Francisco up there, make their way down to Los Angeles and then on to San Diego. He knew they were probably going to travel those routes anyway. His key was to get them to come up along the base of the Eastern Sierras. So he promoted this. He went around to the various locales in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Sacramento, even Lake Tahoe and other places. Hey, why don't we come up with this idea of the PCR? We'll promote it. We'll get people to make the big loop trip when they come out to the Pan Pacific Exhibition. We'll all be able to benefit from people being able to travel on this route, taking in the sites as they go. The other thing said, sure, you want to do most of the work? We'll go ahead and sign on for it. <laughs> so Scott took it on to put this together. They actually, at one time here in California, they had four different El Caminos. I think they were probably, three of them were the idea of Scott. But nevertheless, Highway 101, which really didn't exist in those days, but El Camino Real here between Los Angeles and the Bay Area. Here between Los Angeles and San Diego, it was going to be called El Camino San Diego. As you would travel along the Eastern Sierra, of course, we already had the name El Camino Sierra, and then the route from Lake Tahoe back through Sacramento to the Bay Area, that was called El Camino Capital. In my research that I've done, and I haven't done a lot of research in Sacramento or San Diego, but I really haven't seen much use of those other El Camino names after the Pay Sierra Tour passed. But everybody signed up, Scott started to promote it, he actually went to the Studebaker Motor Company back in Michigan. He said, hey, we're going to promote this big route here in California. We're going to have a pilot tour that we're going to have reporters and photographers. We're going to write all about it. We're going to promote it far and wide in the newspapers and magazines. How about you donate some cars for our tour, for our pilot tour? You'll get lots of publicity from that. The uh, Studebaker said, OK. We'll give you four cars to make that route as part of that publicity effort for your tour. Yeah, Scott had a friend named Peter Kine, who was a very famous travel writer at the time for this still regal magazine called Sunset Magazine. He convinced Sunset Magazine to pay Peter Kine to come and be one of the people that would make the pilot route tour. This was 1912 now. To write about it, to spread the word far and wide of the many great things of the Pay Sierra Tour. So a Sunset Magazine signed on, a photographer from Sacramento, McCurry signed on. All together, 13 people were going to make this trip all around and write all about it. There's the four student makers. They obviously converted one of them to their supply vehicle. This is the old plank road there that where 101 exists between Ventura and Santa Barbara as the four folks from four vehicles were making their way down towards Southern California. Who recognizes where that's at? Just right down the road here is the Pacier Tour, right past where Little Lake Hotel and Resort eventually stood. They made their way through there in the summer of 1912 as they made their pilot tour. This is a little bit farther north. Any of you that have headed into the Mono Basin there south of Lone Pine, there's a very popular old abandoned ranch called the King Ranch on the west side of the highway. People stop there and take pictures all the time. Rush Creek that comes out in Grand Lake. Very popular, very photogenic spot. Great picture for the KCR tour as well. So on the end of the trip, they made their way down through Sacramento. There's Scott there, a second from the right in his trench coat. They were the hardworking person to promote the road. Here's Hiram Johnson. He's now the governor of California, now in 1912. Gillette had been voted out of office. 
So they stopped in there to see the governor, promoting their trip and telling him about all their travels. They made it on back to Sacramento where there was great fanfare in the papers. It was covered far and wide, not just Sunset Magazine, but even the New York Times and all kinds of papers back east promoted and wrote about the big tour that they had made out here. Once the tour was finished that July of 1912, a whopping zero dollars came in your county's way from the state legislature. <laughs> but Scott, Scott was not daunted. He came up with, let's keep going here, we'll just continue right along and we'll eventually be successful. As they thought about it, what do we have here in Indio County that's already well known? How can we possibly capitalize on that? Well, Mount Whitney, for gosh sakes, just outside of Lone Pine, the tallest mountain in the lower 48 states. Certainly we can come up with something around that to promote and get more attention here from the state legislature via the newspapers and others. So here they are promoting the highway, and Scott came up with the idea, well, you know, I read that the altitude record for the United States at the time was about 13,000 feet. Now, Whitney, at 14,500 feet, if we can get someone to fly a plane over the top of Mount Whitney, that would set the new high altitude record for the time. People would certainly read about it, and the papers would report about it far and wide. Maybe that would be their publicity effort that would help get us some attention to get some of that state highway bond money so we can get better roads over here in the eastern Sierras. So they offered $3,000. 1,000 just for showing up, and 2,000 if you were successful, to anyone that could fly their plane over the top of Mount Whitney. They found this young gentleman there on the right-hand side, Silas Christofferson, 24 years old. He was already a barnstorming pilot, one of those daredevil young men, if you will. He had already flown his plane of a four-story hotel in Portland, Oregon. So he was already used to a little bit of that daredevil stuff. Here he is with his wife, Emma, in the Lone Pine Airport. So Silas said, sure, I'll come down. They actually was a big event. It was called Inyo County and Aviation Days. He first started in Big Pine, offered scenic flights around the Owens Valley, flew on down to Big Pine, spent a day or two there offering scenic flights, even spent a couple of days in Independence, where he offered scenic flights in the Crescendo Bill as he approached his attempt at Mount Whitney just a few days later. So he made his way down to Lone Pine, to the crude airport that they had there at the time. It took him five separate attempts, including two in his final day, but on his fifth attempt, as he took off from the little runway down there on the south part of Lone Pine, he flew his plane over a thousand feet above Mount Whitney Summit. Yes, indeed, Silas Christofferson had done it, and it was reported in the papers everywhere. People were, my gosh, the altitude record had been set in Owens Valley there in the Eastern Sierra. Lots of great publicity. I love this, the Inyo Good Road Club under the auspiciousness of promoting an airplane flight. What a great promotion that was. So yes, indeed, lots of coverage, lots of publicity, lots of people paying attention. Not a dime of money coming our way yet. Someone in Owens Valley, probably Scott, read that, well, the federal government, they're gonna get involved in the highway building. This isn't just gonna be a state effort. The federal government wants to build a transcontinental highway from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. They were gonna call it the Lincoln Highway. Well, Scott read that the Federal Highway Department was going to send out some of their best engineers to come and survey the Western United States looking for what would be the best route to get out to the Pacific Coast. Scott saw another opportunity. He enlisted the good folks of Goldfield, Nevada, across the Inyo Mountains over in the western part of, of Nevada to partake in another promotional effort. They were going to invite this gentleman, Anton Westgard, in the Smoky Bear hat there in the center. He was the chief engineer for the highway department. They were going to invite him and his entourage to first have a celebratory dinner down in Goldfield, Nevada, and then make their way over the very crude wagon road now called Westgard Pass over to Big Pine, California. They figure, well, we'll promote this as the route, the Lincoln Highway. He can see the beauty of it. The, the, uh, accommodating way of the people. If we can do all these things, maybe we can convince Anton to put the Lincoln Highway right through 
Goldfield over to Big Pine and then on to the Pacific Ocean. If we can do that, well, the state of California is for sure gonna have to cough up some money to connect to the federal highway that's going to come through our area. So they convinced Anton and his group to come down there. He made his way and had a big dinner in Goldfield, drove his way over the crude road over to Big Pine. So who has gone through Big Pine, headed towards Bishop, and on the very north end of the town of Big Pine, right where you turn right and go to the Bristlecone Pines, you may have noticed there's a very large conifer that sits all by itself. I noticed that many years ago as a young man, and I'm not sure, but I think my dad told me, yep, that's the big pine tree. Well, I took it for granted until I started to do a little more research. If you get out of the car and look at it, <laughs> it's not a pine tree at all. It's a redwood tree that doesn't even grow native on the eastern slope of the Sierra, but they planted it there in that park in honor of Westgard's visit back in 1914 there. They've called it the Roosevelt tree, even though Roosevelt was no longer in office anymore, but I think it was just a big suck up, if you will, to these federal officials trying to clamor for their attention, trying to do anything they could to gain their favor. They ended up naming the high spot in the wagon road between Goldfield and Big Pine, Westgard Pass, after Anton Westgard himself. But Anton made his way, kept the surveying trip, and they eventually decided that the route they wanted for the Lincoln Highway it was going to go north of there, across through Reno, what now is Donner Summit, US 40, and eventually I call now I 80. So no Lincoln Highway for the folks in Big Pine, but we got kind of this consolation prize instead. They, they ran something called the Midland Trail, which was part of a federal highway system. It never had the money or attention the Lincoln Highway did, but for a while we did have the Midland Trail run through Big Pine and on down here towards Southern California as well. So yet one more effort of publicity, and I don't know if that was finally what did it or finally the folks in Sacramento just got tired of it, but finally in the late, I'm sorry, the late fall of 1914, engineers from Sacramento, they finally showed up in Inyo County. They said, okay, let's take a look around here and find out what is the most need of improvement to for our first section of state money here to help build you better roads. So the engineers took a look around and they thought, hmm, that big grade north of Bishop that climbs 3,000 feet and heads towards the tablelands near what now is Mammoth Lakes and Lee Vining and Tioga Pass in Yosemite, that's a steep, a steep road and very hard to maintain. Let's make that be that first 12 mile stretch our first segment of new road that we'll build here for these folks in the Eastern Sierra. Great, except you know where this is? It's not Inyo County, it's Mono County. <laughs> but nevertheless, we finally got our first 12 mile stretch of new state funded highway. Here's the road coming up there. Some of you might be familiar with the beautiful prominent mountain to the west of Bishop there called Mount Tom. Great view looking down there at Mount Tom and Round Valley as the new El Camino Sierra winds its way up from the Owens Valley to the Tablelands near Mammoth. So when it was actually opened a year and a half later, there was a big reason to celebrate there. Right at the top of the grade, which in an area is now called Tom's Place, in a meadow not far from there, they had a big celebration. Over a thousand people, over a thousand people made it to this high alpine meadow to have trout and steak to celebrate the opening of that first stretch of El Camino Sierra and state funded highway in the Eastern Sierras. So the state, after that first 12 mile stretch, we started seeing them quite a bit. They were, had multiple projects on some of the years as they worked on the highway from Mojave all the way to Lake Tahoe. In 1931, they finally completed either a paved or hard surface road all the way from Mojave to the lake. And that required another celebration. And of course, when they had the official dedication of the road completed, Inyo County, Mono County? No, you folks down here in Kern County got to have the celebration of the completion of El Camino Sierra just outside of Red Rock Canyon there. But a great big event that was held and certainly, the folks in Inyo and Mono counties were delighted. 
Not only was it going to be a better, much easier way to conduct commerce, to travel to the urban areas if you needed to, but probably most importantly, people were starting to realize that tourism was probably going to be the shingle that Inyo and Mono County should hang their hats on because, and the new roads were going to be a great way to provide for those people to get up here now that they didn't have to bump and jar, jar themselves loose traveling those old rutted highways of the past. But about the same time that the El Camino Sierra was finally completed all the way from Mojave to Lake Tahoe, something else happened. In fact, as I did my research, I noticed at the same time it was completed, I started to see there was less and less and gradually no more use of the name El Camino Sierra. And it's like, why? Well, I can't tell you conclusively. I have two reasons that I'm sure at least in part contributed, if not completely were responsible. The first, right after the highway was hard surfaced all the way from Mojave to Lake Tahoe, the federal government came in. They were now building federal roads north and south, not just east and west. And they wanted a road from the Mexican border to Canada, not along the coast. They wanted one to be inland as well. So they came up with US, the, the, number, the US highway numbering system started and US 395 was conceived and born. They incorporated state highways that existed, El Camino Sierra being one of them, and a lot of other county and other roads to make this contiguous route all the way from the Mexican border to Canada. Well now, let's call that the Three Flags Highway. That could be a new promotional effort. So it kind of changed rather quickly from El Camino Sierra to this new concept that they called through the 30s and on into the 40s, the Three Flags Highway, but even this name, except for a trading post tourist store that's in the town of Walker, I don't see much reference to this anymore either. The other part of that is by the 1930s, just a little brief touch on the LA aqueduct story here, the L city of LA started building their aqueduct in 1907 and it was completed in 1913. When the aqueduct was completed, most of the water rights that the city had acquired was in the Lone Pine and Independence area, the southern part of Inyo County. No sooner did the aqueduct started providing huge amounts of water to the city, the city's growth totally exploded. And Mulholland said this one quote, and I, I just love it. You know, you, when you first hear it, you go, what? But if you think about it for a minute, it could not be more true. He goes, if we don't get the water, this is in regards to before they ever built the aqueduct, if we don't get the water, we're not ever going to need it which is exactly right. If they didn't get any water to promote growth, they weren't gonna need any more because people were gonna quit moving there if there wasn't gonna be any water. So by the late 19 teens, early 20s, the city needed more water and they went farther north to Bishop and Big Pine and started to acquire the irrigation districts up there. Once that happened, that's when things really started to change in Inyo County. People started to move away, the ranches sold their water rights, the businesses that supported the ranches went out of business. Inyo County lost over 10% of its population between 1920 and 1930. It was a devastating time in the Eastern Sierras then. My guess is the people that stayed, they probably weren't very concerned about a romantic sounding name like El Camino Sierra anymore. They were just trying to hang on to anything they could as far as some kind of economic viability there in the Eastern Sierras. So the name kind of fell out into disuse here by the 1940s, I don't see any recollection of use of it until now. More about that in a minute. A little bit about my favorite folks here. I, I worked in Death Valley for 18 years. I also worked in Yosemite National Park as a young man right out of college as well. I love the outdoors and I've been involved indirectly or directly in the tourism and hospitality business for a very long time. And people that promote it and know how to make it be something that's not only a business for them, but even more, an experience for the people that are using their business. People all year long dream of their vacations and their relaxation and their recreation time that they're going to spend. And these folks that take care of those recreation-minded, vacation-minded folks, they are my heroes. They not only developed the economy of Inyo and Mono counties, but they provided lasting and wonderful memories to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people over the years. So a little bit about this. This is a gas station that used to be in Bishop, California. If you've ever stopped 
at Great Basin Bakery there, right as you come into the south part of town. That parking lot where there's now a jeweler and a hairstylist is where Hazard's Garage used to sit. Lemoyne Hazard was a promoter extraordinaire. He realized early on that people were going to need gas when they got to Bishop as they made their way up El Camino Sierra. They might need some repairs. They might need their repair, their, their uh, tires worked on. So he thought he should get the word out that he was there in Bishop and he could take care of you. I don't know if you can see very well all around, but at the very top here on the left-hand side on the picture, it says Hazards. And that is a red wooden fish with Mr. Hazard's name on it that he used to promote what he had there in the Eastern Sierra. There was a time in the 20s, I'm sorry, in the 30s and 40s where there were hundreds of these signs between Mojave and Lake Tahoe. If you were going northbound, they'd tell you how far it was to Bishop. If you were headed out of Bishop, headed back south, it would tell you how far it was to your destination off to the south. The rest of the country had their Burma shave signs. We had our redfish sign here in the Eastern Sierras. If you would like to see one of these, if you've, never, if you've ever been to the Laws Railroad Museum, it's a little bit outside of Bishop. If you never have been there, I can heartily recommend it. One of a couple of just truly delightful museums we have in the Eastern Sierras. It's a lot more than the Railroad Museum, by the way, though they do a great job with that. They actually have two of these delightful signs mounted on the side of the railroad depot there at Laws. So next time you're in the Laws vicinity, stop in and take a look at Mr. Lemoyne's Red Fish. The promotion became so popular that the tourists started to tell, hey, Mr. Hazard, we want decals for our car. So Lemoyne made decals that they passed out for a while that you could proudly display the Red Fish on the windshield or back bumper of your car as you made your way up El Camino Sierra. Another promoter extraordinaire in the Eastern Sierra, the family that really promoted and built Little Lake Hotel. Little Lake got its start in the late 1890s, but when it first started, it wasn't much more than just a way station. By 1913, a gentleman by the name of Brill Bramlett, who was a race car driver, liked to drive cars fast. He already had raced his car in a Los Angeles to, uh, to uh, Phoenix race across the desert back in 1914, 1915. They called him the monarch of the desert, had lots of publicity. He liked the Little Lake area. He built this wonderful facility down there that I personally have wonderful memories of as my family would travel 395 from Southern California up to Yosemite, Tioga Pass, Lake Tahoe, and other places as a young man. Well, Bill Bramlett knew how to promote things. He was a race car driver, as I said, so one of the things he did was go and set the speed record from Los Angeles to Bishop in his great big Lincoln automobile as he'd made it in a whopping seven hours and 20 minutes back in 1921. Gained a lot of publicity, not only for Inyo County, but for his Little Lake Hotel there as well. Oops. Sorry, there's Bill in downtown Bishop, his brother standing next to him after they set that speed record. It said that there was a number of right-hand turns between Independence and Big Pine through the farmlands as Bill made his way north, and he rolled his car on its side on one of them. But the excited crowd that had come to watch him helped him ride it, and on his way he went. It's still enough time to set that land speed record at the time. So anybody know where this is? When you turn on the Mammoth Turn, Highway 203, off of Highway 395, you might have noticed there's a great big geothermal generating plant off the highway there. You can see it's a lot of green structures and some towers. Well, before the geothermal plant was ever there, by the way, it's a very large plant. It provides electricity for about 30,000 homes. Pretty good size electric plant there. Before that, the Eastern Sierra, that's actually a geyser, much like Old Faithful that was spouting up in the back there. It didn't erupt with the same regularity as Old Faithful did, but it would still come up to life a couple of times every week. Small resort and gas station there, Casa Diablo took care of the visitors and tourists in the Mammoth area long before the Mammoth ski area ever came about. A real tourist attraction that these folks use to help promote hospitality business here in the Eastern Sierra as well. So on a bit of a final note, on a coincidental note as well, at the same time that Gail and I started writing our book about El Camino Sierra and bringing back a little bit of history, 
The folks that run Inyo County in the form of the Board of Supervisors and the County Chief Administrative Officer, they also took an interest in this entire El Camino Sierra thing. They went to the state legislature and told them, hey, you know, we want to bring back the name of El Camino Sierra. It was used here before it was ever 395. It has a rice ring to it. We were always looking to promote tourism here. We'd like to rededicate our highway as El Camino Sierra. If you travel 395 heading north, right at the county line there by Pearsonville, you may have seen a sign that looks just like this. In Yale County, the heart of El Camino Sierra. They got the state assembly to pass a resolution rededicating that stretch of highway in 395 as El Camino Sierra. They have these banners hanging outside of the towns of Lone Pine, Independence, Big Pine, and Bishop, also promoting and trying to resurrect and bring back this romantic sounding name. So, who knows? Inyo County is a small county. Our budget's less than $80 million a year. There's not a lot of money there. I don't know how much they're gonna find to fund much more of a promotion, but over the years, you might see a little bit more of this. I noticed that the county vehicles have put license plate frames around their car promoting it as well. So we might see the old name come back to life, at least in limited form, over the next couple of years. This was the symbol that they made available to some of the businesses in the Eastern Sierra that were going to help try to promote the use of the name El Camino Sierra. This all happened almost at the exact same time as our book came out. One of the other things that they hope to do, if they can find enough money, is to actually put the same kind of signs that the original dedication was back in August 31st of 1910. They call them the birdhouse sign. They hope to make some various historical markers along the highway there in Inyo County to help recognize some of the interesting and unusual history that's happened in our area as well. So we've gone from a time when the dreams of these visionaries at the Inyo Good Road Club of Wisner, Gillette Scott and others, that a highway like this would not only bring commerce and better transportation to the people that lived in the Owens Valley, but it would bring the tourists and the people that were recreating and the people that had the dreams of those beautiful mountains that they knew that existed along that road. We've come from that to the same highway now that's a modern highway with travel, people that are traveling, but something is still the same. It's still a place much, much more than a, a blacktop ribbon, a highway. It's a place that people have in their minds, that their dreams of their vacations, of their fishing trips, of their hiking trips. It's things that keep them going all year as they look to visit this wondrous, wonderful spot that we know as the Eastern Sierras. You know, El Camino Sierra, it's also, it's a state of mind. Thanks very much. So, so the book we have, it's a little bit about the first eight pages are about the history that I've already told you about El Camino Sierra. The rest of the 35 chapters are, like I said, little known history stories that have happened between Little Lake and all the way to Bridgeport. It's an easy read. The books, the page, the, the, uh, most of the chapters are about four pages. Great old pictures that I was very fortunate to get access to, mostly from the Eastern California Museum. So if you'd like it, we have it up here. It's only $11 for one. We find a lot of people like it so much that they want to buy more for their friends and relatives. If you want to do that, you can have two books for $20. We tried to keep it really inexpensive as well. Thank you all very much. Uh, questions I can try to answer about El Camino Sierra or anything else along that line? They did. Does that beat the record of the old Methuselah? It did. Andrew's question was he read that in 1912, for, if you're not familiar with it, the White Mountains, which are just to the east of Bishop there, uh, tall, more barren desert mountains that are almost as tall as the Sierras, they're home to the bristlecone pine, which actually grow in numerous mountain ranges between California on into Utah. But the, old, they, what, the, the unique thing about the bristle cones, they grow to a very old age. And it was always thought that the oldest bristle cone lived there in those groves, about 4,600 years old, called the Methuselah tree. They won't tell you where it's at. They're afraid somebody's going to cut it down or something. 
But in, 19, in uh, 2012, some botanists discovered a tree that's even older than the Methuselah tree by a couple of hundred years old. So now we have the oldest and the second oldest tree that are living, that we know of, that are living there in the White Mountains. I love that, you know, we think we're so hot, hoity-toity and smart and intelligent, and we are, let's face it. But, you know, things like that, 19, 2012, and we still haven't found all the oldest trees in the, in the world yet. I, I love, it exists here in California, which, you know, we got a lot of people here, but we still have things such as that. That's pretty interesting, I think. Yes, sir. I don't speak Spanish, so what does El Camino So if you loosely translate it, and, and if we had a Spanish language class, we would hear other stories. But if you loosely translate it in the intention of the Inyo Good Road Clubs, it means the mountain highway. It, it's, it's a bit of a reach to come up with that, but that was the intent of it, was the mountain highway. Yes. You mentioned the geothermal uh, activity up there. I don't know if you're aware that a good percentage of the taxes that Ingo County collects are from a geothermal activity that's right here. I am aware of that. That's in the book too, but I just touched on it a little bit. Uh, it was that there's actually the, the coat, the, the uh, I'm sorry, the Casa Diablo geothermal plant near Mammoth, which is big. It's actually nothing compared to what you have right up the road here at COSO. That is one of the largest in the entire state. It produces about six times the electricity that Casa Diablo does up there. There's over 100,000 homes that are provided for with electricity from, from COSO, so, which was a resort before, you probably all know that as well, but it was a hot springs resort before the Navy came back there during the World War II and closed it off, but some of the buildings are still there. Okay, well, once again, thank you very much for inviting us to come down here tonight. I, I'm honored to, to be here. Thank you so very, very much. Keep up the great work you do here in the Indian Wells Valley, keeping the history here viable and relevant. Thank you for what you do with that.